Reviewing video games is not something that I really like to do. Not because I can't do it, I've actually reviewed games several times in the past. The reason is because compared to reviewing movies and TV shows, reviewing video games can be an extremely time-consuming process which can leave me very drained. This is because a lot goes into developing a video game that can drastically separate it from how a movie or TV show is developed. It's not just about reviewing the story or characters or themes of the narrative. You have to directly engage with how a video game is designed. The controls, the weight of the gameplay, the amount of repetitivity, the level design, the amount of content they're giving you to justify the $40 to $60 price, the unfair difficulty spikes, and the amount of replay value the game offers after beating it once. There are many, many aspects that go into making a video game that you have to experience, which also makes them a lot longer and require more time to complete and review. Granted, there are some exceptions, like video games that are driven specifically by their story. For example, you don't have to play a Telltale game directly to talk about how badly it was written or how meaningless the decision branches are. In the same way, you don't have to play The Last of Us Part 2 directly to talk about how the story was garbage. All of this is bad enough, but it gets even worse when you realize that he didn't even play the game. And I can prove that he didn't play the game because he admitted it in a tweet and you went out of your way to make an overly long and, quite frankly, unnecessary video about why The Last of Us Part Two is so terrible and why the story doesn't work and you didn't even play it? That is completely insane! You can't do that! You literally cannot do that! Because you can't critique a movie if you haven't even watched it, and you cannot critique a video game if you haven't even played it. Period. You're, you're a fucking idiot. Because of this, I've decided to not do video game reviews unless I have a very personal relationship with the game in question, such as Kingdom Hearts because the series is a childhood pastime, or Mortal Kombat 11 because I felt cheated out of my money with a bullshit Netherrealm pulled by retconning Sindel's character. Which brings me to the topic of today's video, Mass Effect 3, and the many, many ways it failed to stick the landing in one of the most disappointing and most infamous moments in video game history. But first, what is Mass Effect? Even if you've never played it, chances are you've at least heard of it. Back when Bioware was in a steaming pile of trash, Mass Effect was a universally acclaimed role-playing series. You take the role of Commander Shepard in a futuristic sci-fi space opera teaming up with several aliens to fight a looming threat in the form of the Reapers. At first it sounds like your usual Save the Galaxy kind of stuff, except for one crucial detail that drastically separates it from the rest of the genre, the dialogue wheel. Mass Effect was one of those games where you could customize the personality of your character in any way you wanted them to act, through authentic decision-making and player choice. You can increase your charisma to unlock additional dialogue options and obtain dozens of different outcomes that drastically change the story. You could freely interact with your crew and even develop a romantic relationship with one of them. The game also had an extremely massive open world where you can engage in all sorts of side quests that acted as many stories of their own. You'd come across all sorts of side characters and the game gives you a lot of fun ways to interact with them. Granted, there have been video games like this that existed before Mass Effect came out, but Mass Effect took these mechanics and revolutionized them, in a way that very few video game franchises have. I loved the hundreds of different ways I can interact with my squadmates, the different characteristics I could give Shepard, the ways my choices impacted the world and the outcome of the story, and I also loved the world building. If I could describe Mass Effect in one sentence, it would be Lord of the Rings in space. The lore, mythology, the dozens of different races, all the different cultures, and how the different galactic civilizations interacted with each other was so captivating. It was one of the few times where I actually wanted to learn more about this world that I was exploring because it was so rich and had so much to offer. And as you can imagine, when the sequel came out, I was hooked right into it. I would play these games over and over when I was younger, and I purchased all the DLC to get the entire complete story, from Bring Down the Sky to the Lair of the Shadow Broker to the Arrival. I synced dozens, no, hundreds of hours into the Mass Effect series. It became one of my favorite video game franchises of all time. That is, until after I completed Mass Effect 3 and I ended up feeling... nothing. Absolutely nothing. And after all the time I invested in this series, that just made it hurt a lot more. There's a lot of people who will say that the game was good up until the ending, but upon further investigation, that is not the case. Now, the thing about Mass Effect 3 is that because of the hundreds of different outcomes and choices based on decisions you made in the first two games, there's a lot of alterations to cutscenes. Obviously, I'm not gonna go over every single one, otherwise this video would be like a decade long, and with a huge amount of cutscenes already there due to side quests and returning characters, that would just be too much. For the sake of this video, I'm only going to go over the main components of the story to talk about the most vital elements that make it fail. I might bring up some things in between, but I mostly want to focus on the main campaign. 
Now before I begin, it's important that I bring up a number of things since I know this is what everyone is going to be quote mining. EA was forcing Bioware to work the game on a tight schedule which resulted in it being rushed, not getting the extra year of development it needed. And since EA is notorious for being, well, EA, I'm willing to believe that's what happened. However, there have also been interviews with people who worked on the game saying EA was fair and that they were given the time they needed to work on the game's story. This has caused a divide between people who pit the blame on EA and those who pit the blame on Bioware. Well, regardless of whose fault it is, that doesn't change the quality of the final product. Needless to say, it's not very good. There's a lot of people who believe that the story was good up until the ending, and I don't blame anyone who may feel that way. The hype for this game was extremely massive, and after all the time people invested in the first two games, you wouldn't want to believe that it was for nothing. But now that it's years later, and the hype for this game has died out, it's made the huge problems with the narrative more and more apparent. Now, it's not like I'm the first person in the world to have problems with Mass Effect 3's story outside the ending, but it's definitely more widely agreed upon that the story was good throughout and that the ending was just a small dent in an otherwise flawless car. And don't get me wrong, Mass Effect 3 does have some very well-written moments, some of them even being the best in the trilogy. But when you look at the entirety of the story as one collective entity instead of just separating the parts you don't like from the ones you do like, it falls apart. Just going by my own example, my favorite thing about Mass Effect 3's story is the character arc of Javik. There's no arguing with me, he's just the best character in the game. But this is probably just because they ended up downplaying the rest of your squad. James Vega is a forgettable, boring, run-of-the-mill blank slate. I've been around the Mass Effect community, and whenever people talk about their favorite squad mates, James is never even mentioned. Half the time I forgot he was even a character in the game until he appeared on screen. And as soon as he leaves, I completely forget about him. He does absolutely nothing to stand out from the rest of your squad, and you don't even have the option to romance him. Even when you do get the chance to romance him in the Citadel DLC, his character is so badly established that you even wonder why you even bother. The Vermeer survivor, whether it's Caden or Ashley, is absent for a huge chunk of the first two-thirds of the game. You briefly meet up with them on Earth, talk to them a couple of times on Mars, and then they immediately get incapacitated by Dr. Eva. You get the option to briefly talk to them once before the Citadel mission, then you're given the option to kill them during the coup, and if they survive, you're actually given the option to either take them or not include them in your squad. And if you decide to bring them along, they pretty much do nothing of significance unless you romance them. It feels like Bioware had no idea what to do with the Vermeer survivor. They're absent for a huge chunk of the game, and whenever they appear, they don't really do anything. It makes you wonder why they're even in the game at all. Tally is more or less an advisor for the Quarians during the Rannoch arc. Her story begins and ends during this portion of the game. You can interact with her more if you romanced her, otherwise she's just along for the ride. Garrus is here and he's always fun to interact with, but with the emphasis on the Galactic War, he feels more like a side character than a main player. Even Liara feels severely downplayed when you put her in perspective. I mean, she's the Shadow Broker, the most powerful information broker in the galaxy. It's a huge step for her character after the DLC. You'd think this would play a pivotal role in the story, but nope. The fact that Liara is the Shadow Broker is never brought into play. You don't use her resources to complete side quests, and you can't use her resources to help maintain loyalty between different races. They do so little to utilize Liara's new position that you wonder why she was even made the Shadow Broker in the first place. They try to give her this low point moment where she's broken up over the fall of Thessia, except this doesn't make any sense. Liara had no personal relationship with Thessia. She never held it in high regard throughout the series. She was an inferred archaeologist who preferred to be on her own with her studies. Why does she suddenly have an emotional attachment? to Thessia. Hell, she's more broken up about the fall of Thessia than she was about her mother being indoctrinated and forced to kill her. We'll get more into this later, but putting all this emphasis on Liara being sad about losing Thessia is a bizarre and confusing writing decision. There is one very well-written scene where she and Shepard talk about the legacy and the importance of what we leave behind when we eventually die, but aside from that, I can't really think of any significant role she plays unless you choose to romance her. The way the majority of your squad is portrayed in this game just feels very absent-minded, considering the first two games gave them a more important role and variety of options to interact with them. You can interact with them more frequently if you talk to them while visiting on the Citadel, but it feels like a chore with how boring and repetitive it is to navigate. Back on the subject at hand, Javik was the most intriguing and worthwhile addition to your squad. It may seem like a no-brainer since it's the only time you get to interact with a Prothean, but as you spend more time with him you get to see more complexity to his character. He was a soldier raised and bred by war who never got to live a normal life. Spending his entire life surrounded by violence and survival caused him to develop a pessimistic view on the galaxy, and having lost everything he tried and failed to protect, not even having anyone left to relate to his situation since he's the last Prothean has only made him more cold. 
As you interact with Javik more, you get to develop a more intricate relationship with him as a fellow soldier and you see there's more to his personality than being a cold-hearted warrior. He's a troll. He has a monotone sense of humor. He has a more compassionate side that you help him express more openly. And he grows to develop a meaningful camaraderie with Liara. The way he refers to her by name instead of calling her Asari shows how he's learned to see primitives for what they're capable of instead of what evolution forced on them. He expresses a desire to understand what peace feels like after the war is over, overcoming the trauma of what he experienced during the previous cycle. And along the way, he learns about the value of empathy, kindness, and understanding. He evolves from seeing the primitives as nameless assets to use against the Reapers to individual people with hopes, families, and lives. In spite of being from an advanced civilization far beyond their understanding, he learns to view the primitives as equals to him. Of all the squadmates in Mass Effect 3, Javik is the one who goes through a three-dimensional character arc making him the most three-dimensional in the game. In a way, Javik was pretty much the reason I was able to get through Mass Effect 3 at all. If it wasn't for him, I most likely would have just given up and stopped playing entirely. Especially since the villain of this game is more or less a clone of a villain from the first one. I get that Mass Effect 3 was met with a lot of positive reception and it still is, and I completely understand why people feel that way. But there were just so many horrible storytelling moments, and so many things that just kept building up into bigger and bigger problems. Some people will probably say I had unfair expectations of this game, but if that's the argument you want to use, I'm not the only one who had expectations for Mass Effect 3. It's not like we were in the wrong mindset when we went into this game. Mass Effect is not Kingdom Hearts or Gears of War. It is a purely story-driven video game experience. And as an experience driven by its writing, lore, world-building, characters, choices made by the player, and consequences for the player's actions, people were expecting these things to be represented faithfully like they were in the first two games. You can make the argument that this game's negative reception was a result of high expectations, but if that's the only argument you want to use, you're missing the bigger problem here. Let me put it this way. Even if I never played the first two games, that wouldn't erase the numerous plot holes, terrible pacing, and bad writing decisions that went into this game. Because believe it or not, Bioware made Mass Effect 3 as both a sequel and as an introduction for new players. So, Bioware developed this game with the mindset that they wanted people to have Mass Effect 3 be their first Mass Effect game. A series where the most important part of the entire franchise is the story. In other words, you're jumping into this massive world and massive story without any context for anything that came before. That's the equivalent of Marvel Studios wanting Avengers Endgame to be people's first MCU movie. You don't start reading a book by skipping to the final chapter of the story. You're skipping a lot, and I mean a lot of vital information that you need to understand anything that's going on. Mass Effect is a series that acts as a choose-your-own-adventure book. You need to play the first two games in order to properly connect with anything that's happening. Otherwise, you're thrown into this confusing scenario where everyone talks to your character like you know each other when you clearly don't. And I know what you might be thinking. What about the Genesis DLC? This was a feature Bioware added as a means to recap the story in the form of a series of comic strips. On a surface level, it does seem like the right idea. If someone is playing Mass Effect 3 without knowing anything that happened in 1 and 2, they would want a recap to understand what led up to this game. On paper, it's a well-intended idea, but in execution, this does not work. Bioware's solution to introducing newcomers with Mass Effect 3 was to condense 60 plus hours worth of events into 22 minutes. The comic only covers a very small handful of events and the choices given to the player are extremely limited. It doesn't bother to cover a lot of important details like deciding whether or not to reserve Malin's data, whether or not Tally was exiled from her people, whether or not you chose to save the Geth heretics, whether or not you had your ship and squad fully prepared before going into the Omega-4 relay, at least prior to the Normandy crew getting kidnapped to immediately rescue them and get the best ending where everyone lives. It gives you the illusion of player choice while forcing you on a set path. Now you have a playthrough where regardless if you set your character to be a full-on paragon, you have a campaign where you didn't save Malin's data and Eve dies. Also, the comic forces you to choose between killing half your squad and killing the Normandy crew regardless of your readiness rating. Apparently it doesn't take the ship upgrades into account so you have the choice to have a fully upgraded ship and immediately go save them. Which is bullshit since Mass Effect 2 does give you the option to save everyone with a fully upgraded ship. Unless you have a save file for both Mass Effect 1 and 2, you might as well not even bother. The Genesis DLC does very little to include the full story of the first two games while leaving out vital parts of the plot, forcing you to start with an incomplete experience. But that's not the only stupid thing that happens as a result of Bioware trying to make Mass Effect 3 more accessible to newcomers. You'll want to know what you don't do when you're making a video game driven by its story? Give the player the option to not make it story driven. Seriously, they give you the option to not only make the game action focused, but they 
also give you the option to turn off dialogue options. Dialogue options, where the entire appeal of Mass Effect is choosing your character's dialogue to customize their personality. It's almost as if they wanted to make Mass Effect 3 less like a Mass Effect game just to draw in casual players. They weren't making the story their top priority and seemed to be more concerned with drawing in as many people as possible to increase sales. Sacrificing integrity in exchange for profit is never a good idea, because somewhere down the line people are going to notice how horribly your product aged like milk, as is the case for the many, many things we'll be going over in this video. The story starts with Shepard being escorted to a meeting with the Defense Committee of Earth. And right from the very beginning you can see signs this game isn't working right. Admittedly it's difficult to pick up during a first viewing, but let's see if you can figure it out in this scene. What else could it be, if I knew that? You know we're not ready if it is then. Not by a long shot. No, how about this scene? But... there must be some way. If we're gonna have any chance at surviving this, we have to stand together. Still not getting it? Let's try one more. I'm not going! You saw those men back there. There's a million more like them, and they need a leader. We're in this fight together, Anderson! If you haven't figured it out, the problem is that the role-playing aspect, which was vital to the series, is severely downsized. Throughout the game you have all these cutscenes where instead of giving the player a wider variety of dialogue options, all you have is two. Either a Paragon choice or a Renegade choice with nothing in between. A lot of Shepard's dialogue is automatic, resulting in freedom being taken away from the player. Instead of gathering information and making decisions based on that info, you just pick whether to play good cop or bad cop. It's insultingly linear when the first two games offered more dialogue options and branching paths for conversations, especially considering the middle dialogue branch is almost always absent during key situations. Like, imagine if the focus on Sovereign option was removed during the end of Mass Effect 1. It would simplify the player's dialogue options instead of giving them a greater sense of freedom. Even if you want to make the argument it has the same result as let the council die, that's not what's being discussed here. The middle choice, the one that allows you to choose a path between Paragon and Renegade, is nearly non-existent in Mass Effect 3 taking away the more neutral aspects of Shepard's personality. It boggles my mind as to why Bioware thought this was a good idea in a series driven by player decision. Simplifying the dialogue wheel and making a large amount of cutscenes play with auto-dialogue takes away from the role-playing aspect that made Mass Effect famous. It would be one thing if this auto-dialogue was playing during a battle or an action scene, but Mass Effect 3 has so many points in its story where the player should have input but they don't get to have it. You might as well replace the dialogue wheel with the left or right sign since it would be just as valid. So Shepard and Anderson are talking about a couple of things that happened in between Mass Effect 2 and 3, one of which being the destruction of Eratok at the end of Arrival. Now, if you were like me, you were expecting this to come back in a big way. The rivalry between humans and Batarians was established as early as bringing down the sky in Mass Effect 1. The Batarians hated humanity, more so than any other species in the galaxy. Then you have the Arrival DLC, where a human blew up a Batarian system and killed everyone inside. You'd imagine the Batarians would consider this an act of terrorism, an act of war. When I first had that conversation with Admiral Hackett, it gave me goosebumps. All that foreshadowing of a brewing conflict between the humans and Batarians and how it would play a key role in the coming war with the Reapers, it just left me with chills. I was expecting some kind of epic story-based mission where Shepard had to redeem themselves and gain the trust of the Batarians, putting their life on the line to convince them to side with the galaxy to fight against the Reapers. Too bad it's never brought up again. Yeah, they just briefly referenced the Arrival DLC and that's literally it. There's no mission where you go to the Batarian homeworld, no mission where Shepard does anything to redeem themselves to the Batarian people, they just say remember when this happened and just mosey along. The fact that Shepard blew up a Batarian system that could be seen as an act of war never comes back. I get that the arrival was optional content that a lot of people wouldn't have access to, so the story of Mass Effect 3 would be largely made without arrival in mind, but there should have been more for people who did purchase the DLC. Giving us all that foreshadowing, all those warnings of a conflict between humans and Batarians, and then finding out it doesn't actually matter is such an insult for the time people put into this content. Alright, so after that, we move forward and we have our meeting with the Defense Committee. And what follows is the first sign that this story is in big trouble. Apparently, the Alliance is shocked that the Reapers are coming despite that we've been warning them for two games. And yet they made zero preparations to fight them. They accumulated no tactical data and didn't make any superweapon salvage from Sovereign's remains. Are we bone? 
Yeah, we're boned. What the hell is wrong with you idiots? The Alliance military, the very same one that fought Sovereign at the end of the first game, made no preparations for this threat. A lot of people criticize Mass Effect 2 for not being about looking for a way to stop the Reapers, and after seeing this, I better understand where those criticisms were coming from. Why would the Council, the Alliance, or any other force in the galaxy not take the time to make preparations for the Reaper invasion? You're seriously going to dismiss that claim when you needed me to save your sorry ass from a Reaper? And even then, they didn't even bother to come up with any kind of strategy. Instead, you're relying on Shepard in spite of their inexperience in this field. Yeah, they led a suicide mission in Mass Effect 2, but that's a really small-scale situation compared to the Reapers. Also, there's this. What do we do? The only thing we can. We fight, or we die. Shepard just said we fight or we die, but just a second ago they said this isn't about strategy and tactics. I'm pretty sure that fighting largely involves strategy and tactics. In the span of two minutes, Shepard is an idiot contradicting themselves, and yet we're supposed to leave the fate of the galaxy in their hands. There's a lot of people who may call this nitpicking, a single bit of dialogue that can easily be ignored, and I might have been willing to believe that if it wasn't for the fact that this is a problem that is painfully present throughout the game. There are so many moments where the dialogue just nosedives straight into the realm of inconsistent. Like when Anderson says Shepard blew up Sovereign, but they didn't even fight Sovereign. They fought Saren. The Alliance blew Sovereign up. Consistency. It's important for a reason. This is the equivalent of Ryan Johnson being paid millions of dollars to direct Mark Hamill to say the word unfindable. It feels like this dialogue was written by a child, and it just feels off when the first two games had a more consistent tone. After that, the Reapers arrive and start blowing stuff up, and we're thrown right into the gameplay with all our abilities available to us. You know how Kingdom Hearts 3 made Sora overpowered in the very first world by giving him all his powers and abilities by the end of the Olympus storyline? Well, you can blame Mass Effect 3 for popular popularizing that stupidity. It's another example of how Bioware chose to focus on action over narrative consistency. This is the moment we've been building up to for years. The Reapers have arrived, the invasion has begun, the cycle of extinction is at hand. But instead of being immersed in the tension of the situation, we are more focused on firing infinite ammo into the distance, melee bashing enemy heads, and spamming biotic superpowers. There should have been a slower build-up to the invasion, and a more progressive method of giving the player access to Shepard's abilities. The invasion of Earth should have only included basic movement controls, saving combat tutorials for the Mars mission. That way, instead of getting distracted by flashy combat, we'd be able to feel more immersed in the characters and world. All this amounts to a Shepard talking about wanting to stay on Earth while Anderson talks about the importance of forming alliances. It reduces the prologue into a collection of action-based set pieces instead of fleshing out the scenario, reducing the agency and the plot. And it also brings me to question why the Reapers are killing off humanity if they're needed to form a new Reaper. Wasn't the idea supposed to be harvesting organic life? How are you harvesting humanity by blowing up ships and buildings, killing everyone inside? That's like saving an endangered species by gathering up their remaining numbers and having a bunch of poachers sick on them. I really don't know how you're helping. It's also the beginning of that stupid plot point that follows us throughout the game. How Mass Effect 3 is all about taking Earth back like it's suddenly the most important planet in the galaxy in spite of the galactic annihilation thing. And trust me, you're gonna be seeing this a lot. It's practically a running gag with how ridiculous it is. Shepard is constantly talking about taking Earth back and how it's somehow the most important part of the war, like there's anything left to save given how fast Earth is being destroyed. Maybe you can make the argument that if you chose the Earthborn background, this is personal for them, but even then, that's a really big stretch. Why does Shepard suddenly put so much emphasis on saving Earth when the entire galaxy is at stake? I think Javik said it best. The loss of a planet is insignificant next to the loss of the galaxy. Anyway, as you proceed, you eventually come across the kid who was playing with his toy during the intro. This kid somehow teleported from the roof of this building into the air duct of another building without a single explanation for how he got there. Now, this was supposed to be the beginning of Shepard's indoctrination. You know, that theory that a lot of people use to rationalize the stupid stuff in this game? Well, considering that Bioware chose to say the indoctrination theory wasn't real, there is literally no explanation for how this kid got here except magic bullshit. I mean, if this really is the star child from the ending, why is he here now? Does he have the power to shapeshift his form to look like a human child? Can the Catalyst just take the form of anything he wants? Why does he have the form of a human child? Did the Leviathan give the intelligence the ability to shapeshift into human children to manipulate Shepard? Yeah, I think it's safe to say the DLC just made this story stupider. Eventually, you make your way outside, where you have to defend your position from Reaper ground troops until the Normandy comes to save you. There's just one problem. You see, this segment doesn't end after Shepard kills a certain amount of enemies or after a certain amount of time passes. Instead, it's tied to your ammo count. 
The Normandy only arrives when Shepard uses up all of their ammo, so out of curiosity, I looked up a clip of someone just using up their ammo from behind cover, never killing any enemies during this whole encounter. So you mean I can just skip this section at any time by mindlessly shooting at the ground? Well, that doesn't take the suspense out of the situation at all, does it? God damn it, Call of Duty did this better than you! Okay, well, after the Normandy comes for you, you prepare to leave when Anderson claims he needs to stay behind and lead the people of Earth. But what's the point? Why is he staying to fight for Earth? Maybe it would make sense if Anderson was staying to help people evacuate Earth, but that's not what's being implied. The reason he's staying on Earth is because he wants to lead the forces against the Reapers. It feels like an excuse to give Anderson a heroic moment, but there's no logical follow-up to it. There's no strategy to staying on Earth. You need to gather allies and alliances. Why are we even supposed to care about Earth at all? This prologue failed to establish anything significant about it. All we see is that teleporting star child that the player doesn't know or care about, and a defense committee that confirms how the Alliance was completely useless and unreliable. Maybe if we had been to Earth at some point before this moment, but we never get to explore Earth directly in either of the first two games. This is just making taking Earth back the focal point of the story for the sake of marketing. This entire prologue is just mindless nonsense on top of action set pieces. It's clear that Bioware made it this way to draw in casual players and newcomers, but from a storytelling standpoint, it makes no sense. Like, imagine if this opening mission really was your first exposure to Mass Effect. You'd have no idea what's going on, where we are, how we got here, or what any of these characters are saying, or doing, or why. And even as someone who does have context from the first two games, the pacing is unbelievably choppy. You're introduced to entirely new characters who aren't properly established and yet you interact with them like you've known them since the first game. The game just thrusts you into mindless action sequences instead of allowing you to get immersed in the setting. And in spite of Earth having no important place in the story up to this point, saving it is made the top priority. Nothing about this opening mission does anything to properly set up the rest of the story. It's far too rushed. And even then, the dialogue is completely incompetent, with characters doing stupid things and saying stupid things for stupid reasons. And unfortunately, it only gets worse from there. Upon leaving Earth, we receive a message from Admiral Hackett, telling us how Liara found the blueprints for a Prothean superweapon capable of destroying the Reapers. Okay, back up. What do you mean she found blueprints for a Reaper-destroying superweapon? The Alliance has known about these archives for years, decades, and in all that time, they never found these blueprints? I'd say this is an example of plot convenience, but that's actually an insult to plot convenience. There is no way in hell that the Alliance knew about these archives for decades and never found out about these blueprints before now. But now when the Reapers are attacking, suddenly Liara just happens to come across them. This superweapon was never foreshadowed or built up at any point in either of the previous games. It's far too convenient that we're only now finding out about this. So, how exactly did Liara find these blueprints? We've known about the Archives for decades. Why now? Process of elimination, mixed with a little desperation. Um, bullshit! There is no way that you stumbled upon these blueprints out of desperation. If the completion of this thing was so important, why were plans for it never stored inside any of the Prothean beacons? Why wasn't it stored inside Vigil? You're telling me that this device that countless species have been adding to was never discovered by anyone? Not even the Reapers obtained this knowledge from the civilizations they harvested? Okay, this is just an interlude, but a long time ago I remember reading this Game Informer magazine where Casey Hudson was being interviewed. In this interview, he said we'd have to think of a plan to stop the Reapers, and that we wouldn't just come across some long-lost Reaper off button. And here we are, coming across a long-lost Reaper off button. Yeah, Casey just flat out lied to people. How does the introduction of the Crucible in any way make the story better? Seriously, I want an answer. Why should I believe that this Crucible wasn't something they just pulled out of their ass? Maybe this would have worked if we discovered the Crucible in Mass Effect 2, the game that should have been about looking for a way to stop the Reapers. On some level, I might have been willing to believe the presence of the Crucible if they did a better job building it up, but they don't. They just randomly throw it at us completely out of left field. And now, the entire plot revolves around the construction of this stupid thing. And even then, this doesn't even make sense on a tactical level. Why are we suddenly putting all of our faith in this random machine that countless civilizations before this one failed to complete when we don't even know what it does or how it works? Do we even have any reassurance that it'll actually work? Throughout the game, everyone talks like they don't even know what it's going to do when it's finished. On top of that, the idea of completing the Crucible in their current situation is completely ridiculous. They said specifically that the Crucible is a construct of countless civilizations that came before. Something going back millions 
millions and millions of years and none of them ever finished it. So why are we supposed to believe that we have a shot at it? Maybe it wouldn't be so ridiculous if it wasn't for the fact that the game ends with the Crucible being completed 100%. And the Crucible? Ready. Except for the Catalyst. But there's no way to hide the ships we'll be sending at Cerberus. This has got to be some kind of joke. Millions and millions of years of previous civilizations failing to build this thing, and now all of a sudden these guys managed to magically put it together in the span of a few months. And it's not like the Crucible was like 95% complete when the humans, Asari, Turians, and so forth started working on it. No, they show you that it's only half done. Oh, but don't worry, they do take the time to explain how they're building it so quickly. In the stupidest way possible. How's your progress on the Crucible? Good. Our estimates suggest we've completed nearly 50% of the known work. So quickly? Once decoded, the schematics are designed in such a way that allows our scientists to easily translate the information. It's not Prothean specific. Yeah, never mind the fact those languages are from civilizations millions and millions of years older than even the Prothean Empire. Keep in mind, Shepard needed the Prothean Beacon to even understand their language. And the only reason other squadmates were able to understand Vigil was because he was able to program his communication so they can understand him. These assholes should not have a means to understand the languages of thousands of civilizations lost to time. Unless they came across some kind of beacon or long-lost AI for all these other races, which I highly doubt, this is a bullshit attempt by the writers trying to cover their ass. And it's not like it's something you can avoid if you do a poor job getting resources. Regardless of your readiness rating, the Crucible will always be complete. You'll always get the same cutscenes of the Crucible being plugged into the Citadel, and it looks exactly the same no matter how many assets you get. So basically, the EMS that you spend the entire game trying to build up has absolutely no effect on the Crucible's completion at all. So really, there's no point in putting all this effort into getting all these assets. Why do I have to do these side quests? Why do I need to have these numbers? They mean nothing. And it really baffles me how the game is treating this discovery like it's a significant event in the story, with the absurdity of no one ever finding a trace of this thing before now. Why even have this take place on Mars? They could have easily had this happen on any other planet, at least to make the convenient discovery of the Crucible less contrived. With this trilogy constantly talking about how Liara is an expert on Prothean history, this could have been the moment where that element of her character had actual payoff. She could have found the Crucible in an undiscovered location, a place where the Protheans were secretly working on a weapon. It could even give her becoming the Shadow Broker a sense of purpose. She could have found this information using sources she didn't have access to before because she wasn't the Shadow Broker yet. But no, we have to have this take place on Mars because it sounds cool, even though the game does nothing with this location to justify this massive retcon. It makes the accomplishment of Liara finding the blueprints completely fabricated. She didn't find them because she's a persistent archaeologist, she only found them as a result of plot protection. The Crucible is one of the worst examples of a deus ex machina I've ever seen. A lot of people like to say the Star Child at the end was the deus ex machina, but the fact is, it was there right from the get-go. Okay, so you go to Mars and meet up with Liara where you work with her to get the information. In between, there's some cutscenes where the Vermeyer survivor questions Shepard's loyalty, and honestly, it's not worth going into. You don't need a lengthy analyst to figure out that Caden or Ashley keeping up this whole can I trust you stupidity is a forced waste of time. But then we come across something that's far too convoluted to hand wave away. It's here where we come across the Elusive Man, or Tim as I'll be calling him. He explains how he sent Cerberus to Mars to confiscate the blueprints for the Crucible as part of his plan to... <sighs> I can't even say it with a straight face, just let him explain it. That's what separates us, Shepard. Where you see a means to destroy, I see a way to control, to dominate and harness the Reaper's power. Imagine how strong humanity would be if we controlled them. Are you kidding me? I is this like some sort of elaborate joke? There is no way they meant for us to take this seriously. Tim, whose main goal was to assure human dominance in the galaxy, thinks that he can control the Reapers to make humanity stronger, in spite of wanting them destroyed in the previous game. Why? Why is he doing this? What does he think he'll accomplish by controlling the Reapers? Why does he even think he's capable of doing it? He doesn't have any means of overpowering them, he doesn't have any more knowledge of them than Shepard does, and he doesn't even have enough numbers to support him. 
there is absolutely zero reason for him to think that controlling the Reapers is a possible option. And I know a lot of people are gonna bring up how Tim was indoctrinated to explain a lot of stupid shit he does in this game, but that's just shitty writing. Tim was extremely smart and knew about indoctrination. He wouldn't have gone anywhere near the Reaper technology personally, so why would he expose himself to it knowing the risks? What does he think he'll gain from this? Why does he suddenly think he can easily control thousands of billion-year-old kilometer monstrosities who are beyond our understanding? C can I just take a moment to talk about how badly they ruined Tim in this game? Seriously. Why is he like this? Why did they devolve him into such a brainless moron? In Mass Effect 2, Tim was a morally questionable but interesting party. He was idealistic in a way that made sense given his motivation. He was resourceful, and saw the value in cooperating with other groups as a means to forward his own goals. But here, he just views everyone as his enemy regardless of who they are. Instead of teaming up with Shepard like last time or using his charm to convince others to be an asset for him, he just tries to kill everyone. But why would he want to do that? Tim wasn't wasteful. He understood the value of resources and assets available to him. He didn't just kill the opposition or authorize inhuman experiments, and even when he didn't like it, he knew that working with others was the best option for helping out his own goals. Now he's treating his own people like guinea pigs and pointlessly ordering the death of anyone who isn't part of Cerberus. He keeps talking about not being blinded by ideals when that's exactly what he's doing. He completely gives up on his previous goals in some single-minded pursuit for power. They took one of the most intriguing characters and just made him into a generic villain. And furthermore, why are they making Cerberus the main villain of this game? I looked it up. You have 18 missions fighting Cerberus, 11 fighting the Reapers, and 5 fighting the Geth. You fight Cerberus more than any other faction in this game. How is this even possible? How did Cerberus turn into an independent military force in the span of a few months? They have a seemingly endless supply of resources and bases and always seem to be one step ahead of us in spite of constantly losing every time we cross paths. How did Cerberus become this powerful? In spite of the Reapers being the main threat, the game treats Tim like he's the main antagonist. All of a sudden, he's treated like he's the central villain when he doesn't represent the Reapers at all. Even if you import a playthrough from Mass Effect 2 where Shepard was completely loyal to Tim, they're suddenly on opposing sides with no believable transition. Even if it's possible that Tim would believe that trying to control the Reapers is a good idea, why make Cerberus the main villain? The best thing for him to do would be to help the other species and the Alliance. Help them fight the Reapers and distract them. That would buy Cerberus time to figure out how to control them. Have it so that controlling the Reapers is a secret agenda for Cerberus while their public agenda is helping Shepard. They could be collecting resources from destroyed Reapers behind the scenes. They can do that while still working alongside the others. If they work with the other races, they'd be able to retrieve samples from battlefields and figure out how Reaper indoctrination works, then come up with a plan to use that. We can even make this into a gaming mechanic, where Cerberus asks Shepard to help retrieve Reaper samples for the reason of better understanding and how to fight them. If Shepard retrieves enough samples, then Cerberus does get close to this goal and it could be a possibility that they show up near the end offering you a viable way to control the Reapers. But no, we have to make Tim evil and put Cerberus at the forefront for the sake of the plot. This doesn't make the story more gripping. All it does is ruin Cerberus as a concept. In the previous games, they were a mysterious organization working in secret trying to forward humanity's influence in the galaxy. Here, they were turned into generic mustache twirling villains, and their actions and motivations are not explained well enough. Why did they commit resources to attacking the Salarian and Krogan homeworlds? Were they doing it because they were indoctrinated? Were they trying to stop the genophage from being cured? Where did they get a massive army and all those ships and mechs from? Why did they attack the Citadel? So many questions with either no answer or horrible answers. And if you thought the stupidity ended there, that's not even the worst of it. Because now we go into one of the worst things about Mass Effect 3. So remember the collector base from Mass Effect 2? How the game ended with you deciding whether to destroy or reserve it? Well, that ends up meaning jack shit. Your decision regarding the base has no influence on the plot whatsoever. Because no matter what you do with it, Cerberus becomes a villainous faction. The only difference between saving or destroying it is that saving it gives you a tiny bit of VMS for your readiness rating. Why is this so offensive? Because it highlights a severe problem with Mass Effect 3. None of your choices in Mass Effect 1 and 2 matter in the slightest. I mean, remember how your squadmates made the Collector base a big deal? All that haunting foreshadowing if you chose to give it to Tim? Cerberus better than Collectors still wouldn't turn base over to them. Risky. More than risky. Dangerous. Hope you know what you're doing. Can't say I like handing their assets over to the elusive man, but... At least humanity is in the clear. For now, anyway. The fight was great, Shepard. But giving Cerberus the base was... weak. This man of theirs, he hides. He was smart to get you. 
but a real battle master charges with his clan. I know you're working with Cerberus, but turning over the base to them was dangerous. I hope it doesn't come back to haunt us. I'm disquieted, Shepard. I trust you, but not the one you work for. He's driven by wrath and fear. I fear that all we've done is make him a giant. Before we started this mission, I never would have questioned our goals. I just hope we made the right choice. I hope whatever Cerberus finds at that base is worth it. I hope Cerberus can figure out what to do with all that tech. I also hope they don't decide to do something worse than what the Collectors were planning. Watch yourself, Shepard. An interesting choice, Shepard Commander. The old machines offered your race what the Geth aspired to. Unity. Transcendence. Now you possess the knowledge yourselves. We hope you do not use it. Your species has much potential. You should build your own future. I am not sure it was wise to hand that base over to the elusive man. Cerberus has a very narrow view of the galaxy. Nonetheless, the choice was yours to make, and I respect that. Fuck off! And now you're telling me the base was nothing but a red herring? What was the point of the dilemma of the Collector base if it has no influence on the plot? It was just a waste of time. Deciding whether or not to destroy the base was supposed to be a major decision that would have dire consequences. But it just doesn't. The story stays completely the same no matter what you choose. But the Collector base isn't the only thing that ends up being pointless. There are so many meaningless references to Mass Effect 1 and 2 in an attempt to make Mass Effect 3 seem bigger and more important than it actually is. But it ends up falling flat on its face when you realize nothing you do holds any weight. Whatever choices you make don't actually end up making much of a difference. Kill the Rachni Queen? They just make up a second one. Save Caden on Vermeer? Give him Ashley's bitchy personality. Nominate Anderson? Udina ends up taking a spot on the council. Dissuade the Quarians from going to war with the Geth? They declare war anyway. None of the choices you made have any real lasting impact. It's all superficial. Stuff like this makes Mass Effect 3 feel independent from the first two games when it's supposed to be part of a planned trilogy. That's just bad storytelling. If I'd have known any better, those statements I made earlier about Mass Effect 3 being made to draw in newcomers and casual players is starting to make a lot more sense than they should. Okay, let's just keep going. You chase Eva down, she knocks out the Vermeyer survivor, you kill her, and you board the Normandy on your way to the Citadel. You talk with Hackett about coming to the Citadel, and there's a few more conversations in between. One of which involving talking about how he can't beat the Reapers conventionally. Which, to me, sounds like an excuse to force that Crucible bullshit on us. What do you mean we can't fight the Reapers conventionally? Didn't we invent those Thanix cannons? Or any of those heavy weapons? One in particular literally being a nuke gun? The same one we used to destroy a Reaper in the previous game? Why do we even need the Crucible? Crucible at all. I'm pretty sure that the combined forces of the galaxy and all the super weapons they have, including ones that were salvaged from Sovereign, would be enough firepower. Vigil said so himself. And a funny thing about that, there's an outcome that you get during the big fleet battle at the end of the game with a high enough EMS count. It shows us fighting the Reapers conventionally, and the good guys end up winning. They're blowing up dozens of Reapers with minimal losses with enough firepower to destroy a single one in a couple shots. The game says we can't fight them conventionally, and yet we fight them conventionally anyway, and we end up kicking their ass. So if we can clearly defeat the Reapers without this ass pull of a super weapon, why is the story forcing us to rely on it? This is just forcing us to play the game linear instead of getting to make your own choices, in a series defined by the choices of the player. I'm starting to think Bioware was just Telltale in disguise. That's my joke! I'll kill you! You talk to the Council about the Crucible, the Turian Counselor gives you a lead, and you do some exploring around the Citadel for side missions and resources. And in this game, every single visit to the Citadel is a goddamn chore. Not only is it even worse to navigate than Mass Effect 1, but your means of obtaining side quests is extremely repetitive. In the first two games, the side quests were a bit buggy, but interesting. You got to interact with and communicate with different people and obtain information while customizing Shepard's personality. You got to explore the surface level of different planets and you were given a real sense of freedom. These side quests acted as little stories on the side that helped build your character and level up in the process. They were numerous but engaging interactions that provided the player with fun activities. But in Mass Effect 3, side quests amount to nothing but running around randomly while invading people's privacy. Listening to them mention some random things and then you have to go out into a system to scan and search for it. Now a lot a lot of people have gone into detail about how horrible and disorganized the side quests are in this game. The horrible scanning, getting chased by reapers where there's no consequences for getting caught, the journal not giving you information you need to know where to go or what to find, and failing to keep track of your progress in each one. 
but it's not just bad in terms of gameplay. It makes the world of Mass Effect less interesting. There's no interesting exploration or investigation in any of these side quests. It's just eavesdropping, fly to a system, fetch an item, give it to an NPC, rinse and repeat 50 times. There's no variety to it, and it just makes the side quests feel monotonous. The side quests in the first two games were interesting because the player got to feel involved in this world. There was more to it than just going to a system and finding something. It was about being a part of this living, breathing world. You meet different people, learn about them, and you got to choose how to solve each problem you come across. It was a fantastic role-playing mechanic that made you want to explore the world. These side quests don't make you want to explore the world. The entire time you're doing them, you feel like they're being forced on you to increase your EMS. There's no purpose behind these quests other than making numbers go up. And maybe it wouldn't have been so bad if it didn't extend to returning characters, too. Side quests involving Miranda, Katsumi, Zaid, Balak, and several others feel completely wasted on horrible fetch quests. All of your interactions with returning characters are horribly rushed, and their quests amount to little more than running around the Citadel to find a point of interest. You don't even get to properly interact with them because the quests are over within minutes of starting them. What's the point of reuniting with Zaid and Kasumi if we hardly do anything with either of them? And after that, we have these really dumb nightmare scenes, where Shepard has a bad dream about the Star Child while slowly running around a dead forest. They try to make these scenes dramatic and ominous, but my question is why? Why do we have these in the game? Are they supposed to symbolize Shepard's guilt? Why are they so asphyxiated on a random kid they don't know? I wouldn't mind too much except these nightmare scenes are painfully sluggish. You're forced to move in slow motion with no real sense of direction. And the game doesn't put enough effort in getting you immersed in these sequences. Maybe if they were just cutscenes it would be fine, but playing through them just feels boring. They don't add anything to the story, so being given control during these nightmare scenes just feels empty. You do hear whispers of fallen squad mates and friends, but they're not made into the focus of these nightmares. They're all about Shepard chasing after this random kid we have no connection with. It's completely pointless and feels like filler that could have easily been left out of the game. So from here, things are pretty straightforward. You go to Palavin's moon, meet up with the Tarian Primarch, meet up with Rex and the Salarian Diplomat, and talk about cheering the Genophage. And it's here where the Tuchanka arc begins. A lot of people praise this arc for being the best written storyline in the game, but since this is Mass Effect 3, that's not exactly a high bar to jump over. There's still a number of confusing elements and plot holes to be found. For starters, they mention an indoctrinated Molen STG, which is never explored. Are they saying this is the work of the Reapers? Why would they want to compromise the cure? Doesn't that go against their goal of reserving organic life? Why isn't Rex acting diplomatic here? As someone who used diplomacy in a comic exterior to unite the Krogan, he should know that throwing Salarians around and pulling a shotgun on them is not going to get him what he wants. Why is Cerberus on Tuchanka at all? There's never a cutscene explaining why they're there or what their goal is. It really shows how rushed this game was when they couldn't provide an additional cutscene where Tim explains why he sent troops there. And the shroud they use to disperse the cure is just a random deus ex they bring up as a convenient plot device. We're just now hearing about it when the Krogan clan members have been scouting the entire planet. I find it hard to believe that no one found this stupid thing before now. And if the shroud is their plan, how does it have enough power to run the dispersal if Tuchanka has been a wasteland for years? There's literally no solar energy because the planet was decimated by nuclear holocaust. In the bomb site quest, they mention a weapon that was used in the Krogan rebellions that apparently no one thought of activating to use against the Reapers. Why wouldn't they reactivate it when Tuchanka is being invaded? Also, how did Cerberus get the intel for this bomb when the information was highly classified? They should not have this type of information that no one else knew about. And even if they knew where to find the bomb, how the hell did they dig it up so quickly? They clearly state it was able to remain hidden for so long because it was deep underground, enough to go unnoticed. So you mean to tell me Cerberus was able to land on Tuchanka without being detected and uncovered this bomb in a matter of hours? That's bullshit. There are just so many moments of plot convenience in this game that if you made a drinking game out of it, you'd be incapacitated in minutes. If you still don't believe me, then perhaps this will convince you. The Cerberus Invasion of the Citadel, that comes flat out of nowhere in spite of how impossible it would be for Cerberus to accomplish such a feat. I mean, my god. It's incredible how badly they were power scaled from Mass Effect 1 to 3. In Mass Effect 1, the Cerberus operatives you fought were your average run-of-the-mill thugs. They were described as a small subgroup in the Alliance that went rogue. They did nothing to stand out from other human enemies you battled. In Mass Effect 2, Tim spent billions of credits resurrecting Shepard. I'd imagine Tim spent a lot of resources and money into the Lazarus Project to bring a single person back from the dead. 
But in this game, somehow, Cerberus has a shitload of heavy armory and weaponry and the military power to not only invade Tuchanka and Sir Kesh undetected, as well as Thessia from what we see earlier, as well as have enough soldiers to spare for dozens of other operations, but now they invaded the Citadel with almost no effort. There is absolutely no consistency to how they're structured. They're just as big or as small as the plot needs them to be. When Saren invaded the Citadel in Mass Effect 1, he had several advantages that Cerberus shouldn't have. He had a Reaper on his side, as well as the Geth who were armed with advanced technology and capable of easily hacking enemy systems. Are you seriously trying to tell me that Cerberus got on that same level in the span of a few months? That is not possible. There is nothing believable about this situation. Where's the Citadel fleet? Why was CSEC easily defeated? They never improved their defenses? Do they still have shitty security after two games worth of people running rampant around the Citadel? I mean, maybe this would be more believable if we saw Cerberus struggling in some way. But from what we're shown, the battle between Cerberus and CSEC is completely one-sided. Cerberus should not have defeated CSEC so easily. The Citadel is the most heavily guarded place in the galaxy. This invasion shouldn't even be happening. Are we really just supposed to believe this was all made possible because Udina disabled security? And that's another thing. Udina was utterly butchered in this game. In the first two games, Udina was a douchebag, but he was a necessary douchebag. He acted as a representative for humanity and spoke against the Council's unfair treatment of humans. He also put faith in Shepard because he recognizes them for representing the best that humanity has to offer. He was a tough talker, but also a willing ally when it mattered. He also had an open willingness to work on the dirty side of politics knowing there would be people who disagree with his beliefs, because he knows that interstellar galactic politics is a necessary part of galactic society. I'm the one who destroyed the Thorian. I don't remember seeing you around. We can't all be the hero who charges in to save the day, Commander. But we each serve humanity in our own way. You can't escape interstellar politics, it's part of the big picture, and sometimes it isn't pretty. He was bold, straightforward, and stood for his beliefs no matter who stood against him. These things helped to make Udina an interesting character. Mass Effect 3 ruins his character. Like, completely obliterates it. They basically just made him into a stupider version of Tim sacrificing his previous beliefs in some stupid single-minded pursuit for power. And it doesn't even make sense since he said this in an earlier scene. With Parliament destroyed and Shastri gone, I have more power than any human in history. But today, you saw how little that is. Really? Well, if you have more power than any human in history, what the fuck do you need Cerberus for? Your motivation is asinine. Why do you care how much power you have or how much power humanity has on the Citadel when the Reapers are destroying everything? You have zero reason to sell out your loyalty to Cerberus. He's the Human Counselor. He is making an alliance with an organization who is the enemy of the Council, which is actively going to reduce his power. He is acting completely against his own interests. He's not even indoctrinated like Tim. For what reason does he think teaming up with Cerberus will make him more powerful? There is literally no reason for this to happen except artificial tension and to force Udina out of the plot. What was even Cerberus's goal here? Even if they did succeed in taking over the Citadel, what did they think was going to happen after? Did they really think there was going to be no revolt from the other species? Did they think they were just going to sit back and accept Cerberus as their new rulers? A lot of them are already on shaky terms with humanity, so I would imagine this would make them look worse. I'd say this would be the most retarded thing to come out of this subplot. But unfortunately, this is where we're introduced to Kai Lang. Who is Kai Lang, you ask? Well, let me give you a breakdown. Kai Lang is an elite Cerberus operative who has advanced close combat training, abundance of convenient plot armor, enhanced biotic capabilities, undetectable stealth skills, heightened reflexes, and tactical expertise who Tim has had access to since before Mass Effect 2. Now, why would Tim spend billions of dollars and countless resources resurrecting Shepard when he could have just gotten this guy the entire time? The answer? I have no fucking idea. Let me tell you, if it wasn't for the Star Child, this would be the stupidest thing about Mass Effect 3's story because everything about Kai Lang is contrived and forced into the game for no reason other than to give Shepard an annoying rival. Why? Just why? Why would Tim want anything to do with Shepard with Kai Lang around? This just makes him look even stupider for investing all of this time into Shepard just to dispose them. Why did you spend all that money, all those resources, and all that time getting Shepard on your side if you were just going to make them your enemy? You could have spent the last two years working with Kai Lang. Instead, you wasted it turning Shepard into cybernetic space Jesus. You moron.
But really, that's just scratching the surface. Even without the absurdity of Tim wasting his time on Shepard when he could have just gotten Kai Lang, he's still a horrible character. The game spends so much of the second half of the story hyping this guy up and making him look like an intimidating nemesis to contend with. He kills Thane, he kills Miranda if you didn't warn her about him, he outsmarts Shepard on Thessia taking the Prothean VI, you're told by Anderson how he's a bigger threat than the Reapers, <laughs> no. And he gloats at Shepard about failing to defeat him at Thessia. From that description, you'd think he would be a menacing antagonist and a real badass who would put you on the edge whenever he appears. Instead, Kai Lang is one of the most hollow, boring, forgettable, generic, one-note, empty, meaningless, and wasted characters in video game history. I cannot think of a single noteworthy thing about him that's worth bringing up. His personality is so flat and wooden he might as well be a talking plank, and his dialogue amounts to little more than gloating and complaining. They try to give him plot significance by portraying him as a dangerous figure, but every time he's on screen, he does nothing to leave an impression. He makes three major appearances, and two of them are having you kick his ass. And in each of his cutscenes, whether major or minor, he adds nothing to the story. He just walks around taking orders from Tim without the writer showing us any of his own motivations. They do nothing to flesh him out or even make an attempt to give him depth. He's just a generic Eric Henchman. And that's a problem when the game is constantly overhyping him and making him seem like a big deal. Hell, the one-shot villains from Mass Effect 2 had more established backstory and developed personality. He's flimsily introduced in the second half of the last game in the trilogy, he barely gets any screen time, and all he does whenever he's on screen is gloat while getting his ass handed to him. He's just a random asshole that neither the player nor the protagonist knows anything about, and yet the game expects you to accept him as an important character with no setup. Even during the three times you fight him, he does nothing impressive. All he does is swing a sword around. Which, by the way, why does he even use a sword? It's just a generic piece of metal in a universe where everyone is using highly advanced futuristic guns and biotic superpowers. And it's not like the sword is augmented to be like this unbreakable titanium. You easily break it by punching it. It's literally just a plain sword that's completely worthless in the Mass Effect universe. And the way he's killed off just makes him look like a total bitch. If you use the Renegade Interrupt, you easily break his weapon. If you don't, you just dodge his attack like it was nothing. This brings me back to the Game Informer magazine I mentioned earlier. In the interview, Casey foreshadowed Kylane's presence by saying Shepard would come across a rival who would truly put them to the test. So either Casey was buying into his own hype way too much, or this was yet another lie he tried to sell people. Kai Lang is just pathetic. Fist's bodyguards were more intimidating than this guy. So as we move forward from that utter stupidity, it's time to help the Quarians take back their homeworld from the Geth. Well, so much for convincing them to not go to war in the second game. And, as you'd imagine, the situation doesn't make a lick of sense. They mention how Admiral Geralt tried to enact a frontal assault on the Geth which is not only suicidal, but stupid. Why would you order a frontal assault on a military power that clearly has more might and more advanced technology than you? There's literally zero strategy in that. And he should know better considering he served in the military for years. Either he's a really shitty admiral, or the Quarians just don't know how to properly plan an attack. I mean, these guys are so stupid that they actually agree with Gerald to send the civilian ships into battle. I reiterate, they agreed with Gerald to send civilian ships into battle. Civilian ships that aren't built for military combat carrying non-combatants into a fight. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. Oh my. Oh my. But here's something that really bothers me. Before the mission, you have a conversation with the admirals about a plan, and for some reason they do this foamed-in recap of their history. Your homeworld? You mean Rana? Correct, Commander. 300 years ago, we lost our world to our own AI creations, the Geth. After we attempted to kill them? We didn't try to kill them, Chorus. We tried to deactivate them. It wasn't murder. No, it was murder. Commander, the Quarians never intended to create a true AI. It was an accident. Which you chose to correct by trying to kill them. This may seem like a small problem that can easily be ignored, but when you look into it, you see how it plays into one of the worst things about the story. The Admirals are relaying this information to Shepard, who has already known for years about the history of the Quarians. For God's sake, the dialogue option is literally called, tell me about your history. Why are you asking them about their history when you already know their history? Were you just daydreaming during all your conversations with Tally and Mass Effect 1? There is literally no reason for this at all. Why is this in the game when it doesn't and benefit the player in any way. 
Oh wait, I know why. Because Bioware was stupid enough to make the last game in a planned trilogy about introducing casual players and newcomers. This conversation was put into the game specifically for people who couldn't be bothered to play the first two games. It just amounts to an obnoxious waste of time for people who already played them. And this conversation with the Quarians is only one of many examples of this. Because my people uplifted the Krogan, we know them best. You mean you used us to fight a war you couldn't win? It wasn't the Salarians, or the Asari, or even the Turians that stopped the Rachni. It was Krogan blood that turned the tide. And after that, you ceased to be useful. The Genophage was the only way to keep your urges in check. There are so many moments like this throughout the game. So many scenes of ham-fisted exposition where the writers go, Remember this from the first two games? That's all just empty dialogue that says nothing and conveys nothing. I said it before and it bears repeating. If you're making Mass Effect 3 your first Mass Effect game, you're experiencing Mass Effect wrong. You don't start your Lord of the Rings experience with Return of the King. You don't start your Harry Potter experience with the Deathly Hollows, And you certainly don't start your Kingdom Hearts experience with Kingdom Hearts 3. Where did you get a vessel? Same as you. Same how? Most of the organization's members, they traveled here from the past as hearts. And you had replicas ready and waiting. One for each of them. What the f is going on?! So our first assignment of the Rannach Arc is to go inside the ship and disable a Reaper signal powering the Geth. While inside, we come across Legion, who helps us by disabling the Drive Core. Instead of, you know, taking control of the ship. Why wouldn't he take control of the ship? He had access to the source code. That's a really valuable resource you're just deciding to waste. Though I guess it's not as bad as Gerald, who decides to destroy it, while Tally is still inside the ship. Your stupid minds! Stupid! Stupid! What the hell is wrong with you? You order civilian ships with non-combatants into a military situation, you order a frontal assault on a fleet with more power than you with no tactical strategy, and you're willing to kill off one of your admirals? And not to mention how wasteful you're being by blowing up the Geth Dreadnought instead of salvaging it. Legion disabled the core. It's no longer a threat to you. You should be salvaging it, especially when you said in your own words that it's more powerful than anything the Quarians have. Get control of the ship, reprogram it, salvage the technology, and use it as a resource against the Reapers. But no, it's better to just blow it up and kill Tally in the process. This guy has gotta be the worst general ever! At least Bioware got one thing right, giving you the option to punch his sorry ass. <laughs> And another huge problem with the Rannoch Arc is how badly it contradicts the idea that we can't fight the Reapers conventionally. The Quarians have a satellite laser capable of blowing up a Reaper from orbit with a couple of shots. The Geth can provide you combat software capable of neutralizing the Reaper code. And both of them are masters at hacking enemy systems which have been used to combat Reapers in the past. Why are we being forced to use the Crucible again? With this on top of heavy weapons, Stanex guns, nuke grenades, and other advanced weaponry, we have plenty of ways to fight the Reapers conventionally. Player choice, my ass! Okay, so you kill the Reapers and choose what happens to the Quarians and Geth. In the event you side with the Geth or broker peace, Legion sacrifices himself to give the Geth true sentience. And it really shows not only how badly written, but emotionally manipulative this game is with how ridiculous Legion's death is. He is software. What's stopping him from simply copy-pasting the Reaper code without sacrificing himself? Just two missions ago, he was doing the exact same thing on the Dreadnought to broadcast the signal to all Geth. Why don't you just do that again? At least copy yourself and reserve it on another platform. There is no reason for this death to be taken so dramatically when there are dozens of ways to prevent it from happening. God damn, this game age worse than a Pepsi left on a beach in the middle of a hot summer day. Next arc, you talk to the Asari counselor who mentions a point of interest on Thessia. She tells you about a construct you can use to complete the Crucible, which turns out to be a Prothean beacon. So the Asari were selfish pricks who held vital technology for themselves, and had they been more open about it, we'd already know about the Catalyst and we wouldn't be in this mess. Kinda makes it hard for you to feel bad for them when Thessia ends up falling. And what makes it even more ridiculous is that this is supposed to be the emotional low point of the game. Seriously, everyone in the Normandy is sulking and acting like they've been completely defeated because of Thessia, and not because of Earth, Palavin, Tachanka, Sirkesh, Rannoch, or any of the other worlds. Why is this the moment where everyone is losing hope? 
You spend the entire game trying to convince people there's still hope for Earth, but now all is lost because you think there's no hope for Thessia, when Earth was already being destroyed for months? That doesn't add up. The drama they're going for is completely dry and artificial, and there's no real stake in it with all the time you spend telling people you can still save Earth. So make up your mind. Either you have hope or you don't. Even the moments leading up to it take away from the tension we're supposed to be feeling. You mean to tell me the most well-kept secret in the galaxy hidden by the most advanced civilization could have easily been revealed if some rando just walked in and destroyed the statue? It's not like they tried to hide this particular statue, it's literally in plain sight for everyone to see. What if someone just felt like vandalizing it and suddenly they saw a glowing aura inside the stone? And another thing, how the fuck did Tim get this highly classified information on the Prothean Beacon on Thessia in Mars? And what was that highly classified information on the Prothean Beacon on Thessia even doing on Mars? Is Mars just this treasure trove of deus ex assholes that no one could figure out until now? And my god, why is Tim still going on about his stupid ideals about controlling the Reapers? It's not interesting, it's not compelling, it's just a boring and stupid waste of time. So somehow, don't ask me how, Samantha was able to track Kai Lang's shuttle as it flew through a relay into the horizon. You see how pathetic Kai Lang is? His downfall was the result of some random woman on the Normandy tracking down his shuttle to a Cerberus facility. And he didn't even bother to make sure he wasn't being tracked. No offense, Anderson, but you're a dumbass if you ever felt threatened by this guy. So you follow Kai Lang to Horizon, meet up with Miranda, kick her father's ass, and Miranda gives you the coordinates for the Cerberus base. There's this in-between plot point where they explain how the facility was for researching a way to control the Reapers so the Reapers send ground forces to stop them, which brings you to question why Kai Lang and Tim are working against the Reapers if Vendetta confirmed they're being indoctrinated, but I honestly don't give a shit because Bioware clearly didn't. You go to the Cerberus base, blow shit up, kick Kai Lang's ass, and you have another stupid conversation with Tim. I also just love how the same guy who spent trillions resurrecting Shepard couldn't be bothered to install some kind of security to keep people from waltzing into his room and stealing information from his computer. I'm not even kidding, they just opened the door like it was any other door. The Krusty Krab has better security than this. Everything, Shepard, everything I've done has uplifted humanity. Not only above other species in our galaxy, but over the Reapers. How? All you did was turn your troops into blue-eyed husks. How does that make you more powerful than the Reapers? I've been killing your troops throughout the entire game like any other group of enemies, and yet you insist you've uplifted humanity? Maybe if your idea for uplifting humanity was turning it into target practice. We are fighting each other while the Reapers occupy Earth. It's time to stop. Your idealism is... admirable, Shepard. But in the end, our goals are simply too disparate. I believe destroying the Reapers would be the worst mistake we could ever make. Okay, why? Why do you think destroying them is a bad thing? They are literally out to get us. They are killing everyone by the zillions. They are beyond our comprehension to understand, they can't be negotiated with, and they are bent on turning the entire galaxy into goo. You have provided no reason for why keeping them alive would be a good thing other than your stupid human dominance ideology. This is literally the worst thing to believe in when they're turning the entire galaxy into vaporized dash. Why are we even having this conversation if you already found everything you want? You're just wasting time and proving how stupid you are because you didn't bother to delete this data on your computer to prevent Shepard from discovering anything. What are you even going on about? Transcending humanity above the Reapers? If you think you've transcended humanity above the Reapers, then why do you even want to control them? You have technology to bring people back from the dead after their body was annihilated from falling thousands of feet from orbit. You literally don't need them. Jesus Christ, this plot is so stupid. You finish talking to Tim and start talking to the Prothean VI. He tells you the Citadel is the catalyst and that it's the key to completing the Crucible. Which brings me to question, why didn't the Reaper start their invasion with the attack on the Citadel? You know, the heart of galactic civilization? Why didn't they just do what they did last time when they attacked the Protheans? They can switch off the mass relay so all the races can't organize their military forces and are cut away from each other. You'd think that the ancient super-intelligent robots would have incorporated that strategy, instead of giving the races a chance to fight back. How is it that a dumbass like me is coming up with smarter warfare tactics than the all-knowing ancient aliens? We find out that the Citadel has been moved to the Soul System on Earth, which seems dumb since Thessia was closer and the Asari are more advanced. Wouldn't it make more sense to go to the Asari homeworld since they have better technology? But no, we have to make it about taking back Earth because it sounds more epic in the advertising. Speaking of which, it's time to end this bullshit. We're given a brief summary of the plan. 
where we have to reach the Citadel in order to activate the weapon. But here's my question. If our objective is to get to the Citadel to activate the Crucible since it's the catalyst, why don't we use the Conduit, the mass relay linking Ilos directly to the Citadel? Just send Shepard in the Mako like last time and have them make their way to the center. Even if you want to make the argument they have to go through a specific entry point, they know that it's in London. Have the Normandy transport Shepard near the beam and they'll just run for it. And if the area is being protected by Reapers, blow them up. We have dozens of ways of destroying one in a couple of hits, so it's not like we'll have a hard time getting through. And there's another hole in this plan. If the Reapers know we're trying to get to the Citadel through the beam, why don't they turn it off? They have complete control over it. They can just turn it off, which would throw off the enemy and possibly trap them. But hey, these are the same Reapers that didn't start their invasion with the Citadel, so expecting them to use a tactical advantage would be wishful thinking. Anyway, we start the final battle as we see all the fleets and allies assembling for their attack on the Reaper forces of Earth. Pretty much the series endgame moment. But here's the problem. This plan of attack is really convoluted. You got thousands of starships all huddled next to each other in a very close proximity. These ships, if they take enough damage, will explode causing debris to fly all over the place. And with the ships so close to each other, the debris can cause a chain reaction where all the allies end up destroying themselves. In the Chronicles of Narnia and the MCU, the good guys also had allied forces is huddled up next to each other, but they weren't spaceships that could explode. They were ground troops made up of flesh and bone. So you didn't have to worry about a chain reaction where they self-destruct their forces if someone gets shot. This is a backwards plan of attack because of all the ways it could go horribly wrong. If the Reapers land a lucky shot and destroy something big like the Quarian fleet, there's gonna be a lot of team killing going on. And even if for some reason you don't view this as a plot hole, the fleet battle is so generic and boring. For two minutes, all you're seeing is spaceships flying around and lasers being fired at Reaper forces. It's as basic and one note of a spaceship battle as you can get. There's no spectacle or adrenaline to this battle because they put so little effort into making it exciting. And on top of that, when you eventually get to Earth's surface, you get absolutely zero payoff for all the time you spend gathering resources and allies. There's no cutscene showcasing all the allied forces you accumulated or any of your squadmates from the previous games. No Elcor, no Volus, no Vorcha, no Hanar, no Drell, no Corians, no Geth, no Batarians, no Salarians, no Turians, no Krogan, no Rachni, and no Leviathan in spite of them being the most crucial race if you bought the DLC. No Blue Suns, no Blood Pack, no Eclipse, no Omega Forces, no ex Cerberus Forces, no clans of any sort. You don't see Rex leading Krogan, Grunt beating down enemies, Miranda and Jack teaming up, Zaid shooting down husks, Samara using her biotic powers against Banshee, Jacob fighting alongside human soldiers, or Arya fighting to avenge Nereen. I mean, look at Avengers Endgame, where you see everyone coming together for the final fight against Thanos, Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Black Panther, Ant-Man, The Wasp, Iron Woman, Bucky, The Falcon, Hawkeye, Doctor Strange, Scarlet Witch, Spider-Man, Captain Marvel, all these characters who get their own badass scene of glory showing you how much they've developed and how powerful they've become. That was an actual payoff for all the time you invested in the MCU. What's the payoff in Mass Effect 3? Just spaceships shooting each other and Shepard doing more of what they've been doing throughout the game. Unlike Mass Effect 2 where you get to see all your assets being put to use, Mass Effect 3 just has a single generic fleet battle and then focuses entirely on Shepard. This isn't an epic final battle with all the galaxy coming together. This is just Shepard cleaning up the Council and the Alliance's mess after they did nothing to help. Seriously, Bioware? Fuck all of you for all the time you tricked me into wasting on this franchise just for me to get nothing in return. This is what I mean by EMS having absolutely no value. You waste all that time trying to make those numbers go up and you are given absolutely no reward for it. The only thing EMS determines is whether or not the Earth gets destroyed and if the galaxy gets obliterated if you pick the destroy ending. And it has absolutely no influence on the controller synthesis ending. And even then, the Mass Effect 4 trailer confirms that the destroy ending was canon and that the galaxy wasn't destroyed. Literally, EMS has no reason for being in this game. It's an entirely meaningless mechanic. What a fucking load. I got more payoff for the money I spent eating food from Taco Bell. At least I got to eat some good cheese roll-ups before the unsettling bathroom experience. And now for the moment you've all been waiting for. The one thing that everyone seems to believe supposedly saved this game from being condemned as a terrible storytelling experience. The extended cut. Bioware's attempt to address all the fan backlash and give us a proper sense of closure for the Mass Effect trilogy. And I'll give them this. It is better than the original cut version from launch, but a polished turd is still a turd. Let's get started, shall we? First you have Shepard calling the Normandy 
for evacuation, helping your team escape while having an emotional goodbye with your love interest if you have one. It sounds good on paper, but there's a number of holes with this setup. First, we see how the Normandy, by some unexplained space magic, arrives on the scene in the middle of a Reaper attack in a total of five seconds after Shepard called Joker. <laughs> Serious? What the jingle balls is this crap? You mean to tell me that Harbinger not only doesn't bother to fire on the Normandy, but that the Normandy is somehow fast enough to get to Shepard's location in five seconds from the space battle? If the Normandy was really that fast the whole time, I have some questions. Why didn't they escape from the Collectors in the beginning of Mass Effect 2? Alright, so this is a quick response to people who make the argument this isn't the same Normandy that was destroyed by the Collectors since this one was made by Cerberus. In the first game, the Normandy is established to be the most advanced ship in the Alliance Navy. Conversations with engineers and Admiral Mikhailovich explain how it cost a lot of credits to build and it was built with the most state-of-the-art technology. They directly state it's the fastest vessel ever designed. And it was co-built by the Turians who were established to have the most advanced military power in the galaxy. There is no reason to believe the original version of the Normandy is incapable of the same maneuverability and speed as the one Cerberus built. If you want to make the argument the Collectors had a more advanced ship, that's still not a good enough excuse. Because in the suicide mission, we clearly see the Normandy flying circles around the Collector ship. Yes, your crew members can still die if you don't upgrade, but those upgrades are restricted to armor plating, kinetic barriers, and heavy cannons. None of which are related to the Normandy's speed and mobility. There's not enough dialogue to indicate that the Cerberus Normandy was made to surpass the original in terms of speed and mobility. It was said to be a direct replica of the original. Why did it take so long for them to show up at the beginning of Mass Effect 3? Why did it take so long to get to Mars? Why don't you just take us to the conduit on Ilos? This war should be over in two minutes. Also, we are at the most crucial moment in this war. The final run to get to the Catalyst to activate the Crucible. Anderson told us that we can't retreat once we go down there. And now you're having Shepard call for evac? Who are you even evacuating? Just two people instead of a group of injured or incapacitated soldiers? It's a waste of fuel. Also, in spite of this extended cut supposedly being an improvement over the original, Harbinger, for some reason, still leaves the Citadel beam unguarded. He doesn't make sure Shepard is dead, he doesn't turn off the beam, we don't even get a proper boss fight with him. If by extended cut you mean extending Bioware's middle finger, then you succeeded with flying colors. Insert Marauder Shields joke and we make our way to the Citadel's control room, where Anderson is waiting. Okay, what the hell is going on here? How did Anderson get to the control room before us? He was never seen entering the beam and he says that he followed Shepard. How did you follow Shepard if you were nowhere to be seen after Harbinger's blast? And what do you mean by you didn't come out of the same place as Shepard? There is only one entry point in this part of the Citadel. How the fuck did Anderson get teleported to another location? And if that wasn't stupid enough, we also come across Tim. How the hell did he get here? Did he just waltz over to the beam while explosions were going off around him? Did he get here before the attack and was just waiting to surprise Shepard? If he was already here, why didn't he activate the Crucible to control the Reapers? Stop using indoctrination as an excuse. It's not a get out of jail free card for bad writing. I warned you. Control is the means to survival. Control of the Reapers and of you, if necessary. You literally never said that at any point in Mass Effect 2. Your goal was establishing human dominance, not survival by controlling the Reapers. They're controlling you. I don't think so, Abby. Okay, then explain the operation where you had Reaper tech put in your body. Why would you even do that? Did you really think it would make you safe from indoctrination or that having it would make you less susceptible? I've dedicated my life to understanding the Reapers, and I know with certainty the Crucible will allow me to control them. The data you found at the Archive said nothing about the Crucible's function. They were only blueprints on how to build it. Now you're just spewing random gibberish. And what if he's wrong? What if controlling the Reapers is the answer? You literally said in our previous encounter that you transcended humanity above the Reapers. Why do you still want them if you believe you surpassed them? Do you think power like this comes easy? There are sacrifices. You sacrifice too much. Shepard. I... I only wanted to protect humanity. Someone who's this obsessed with power does not do anything out of a desire to protect. Even in Mass Effect 2, you made that clear. You've done exactly what the Reapers wanted. You're still doing it because they control you. I... They're too strong. 
At this point, this is just a rehash of the confrontation with Saren. They really couldn't think of something else for the final battle? You know, if you're going to be lazy, at least be lazy in a different way. Don't make your incompetence that blatantly obvious by repeating yourself. Long story short, he dies and you activate the Crucible. After that, Shepard sits down alongside Anderson, giving him comfort in his final moments. And what follows is... actually a well-written moment. Shepard and Anderson just taking a moment to talk, to reflect on everything they've been through. It's a somber and delicate scene that perfectly captures the core of their relationship. <sighs> Commander? We did it. Yes, we did. It's uh, quite a view. <laughs> Best seats in the house. You ever wonder how things would have been different? How our lives would be different if this hadn't happened. Sure. I never had a family, Shepard. Never had children. There'll be time enough for that now. <laughs> I... I think that ship is sailed. What about you? Ever think about settling down? I'm a soldier, Henderson. Like you. Not really fit for doing anything else. I don't know, Shepard. I think you'd make a great dad. Thanks. Think how proud your kids would be. Telling everyone. Their dad... is Commander Shepard. I don't know about that. Not everything I've done is something to be proud of. God, feels like years since I just sat down. I think you earned a rest, Anderson. Mm. Mm. Stay with me. We're almost through this. You did good, son. You did good. I'm proud of you. Thank you, sir. Anderson? Anderson has always been Shepard's pillar. He's always had their back, been at their side, willing to sacrifice everything for them. It feels like Shepard is whole and consoled when Anderson told them he was proud and that they did good, and they could finally let down all the pain that they've endured. Together, they accomplished the impossible, and saved the galaxy from an incomprehensible foe. You can feel the regret Anderson has for himself, practically begging Shepard to not wind up like the same old battered warhorse he sees himself as, encouraging them to make a life for themselves outside of war and conflict. It's a personal conversation that feels more personal with all the time you spent interacting with him, like you're actually speaking with a father figure. And with that, Anderson rests his head, and after a long life of endless fighting, he can finally know peace. Shepard looks on, watching the beautiful side of Earth from orbit. It's slow pace, but it's done in a way that helps you get immersed in the moment. It's quiet and somber, allowing you to just take it all in. All they have to do now is give us a proper conclusion to the Mass Effect trilogy. Now, before I go any further, I need to talk about the importance of an ending. A lot of people like to make the argument that it's more about the journey than the destination, but this is said by people who underestimate the importance of an ending. This is the part of the story where the author says, this is it. This is what we've been building up to since the beginning, where the audience is told that this was all worth it. Endings to a story are something that have to be handled very carefully, because it acts as the payoff for all the time you invested into a series. It acts as the culmination for all the character development and all the world building established throughout the story. 
and if you mess that up, it'll make the story feel incomplete and unfulfilling, leaving you with a feeling that you wasted your time. People don't like to admit it, but we think more about how a story ends than how it begins, especially if it ends badly. With that fact in mind, it's absolutely crucial that when you get to the end of the story, you have to make it satisfying on every level. Imagine the kind of ending we could have for Mass Effect 3. The Crucible is activated, the Reapers are destroyed, peace returns to the galaxy with dozens of centuries old conflicts being settled in the face of a greater threat. After the cheering and celebration, there's a memorial for those we lost along the way. Shepard and all their friends putting together a funeral for Anderson, paying their final respects to him. After that, we have a flash forward into the future. We see all the characters we grew to love living happily in their new lives. We see Shepard and their love interest raising a family. We see races who were once enemies cooperating as allies for a better galaxy. And Shepard looks out into the field of their new home, thinking about the comrades they lost, but how their sacrifice was for a great cause. The insurance of a happy and peaceful future. It sounds cheesy, but that's what every fan of Mass Effect would have wanted. After the hundreds of hours we spent getting invested in these characters and their stories, exploring this world, learning about its history, we deserve an ending that shows respect for all of that. An ending that shows how Bioware truly values us for all the time we spend playing their games. If Bioware had just done that, if they gave Mass Effect 3 the proper ending it deserves, I would not be making this video, because that's all I would have wanted. An ending that leaves me happy for all the time I invested in this trilogy. The characters I grew to love. This world that I love spending time in. The immersion of the dialogue and gameplay. Getting to customize my Shepard how I wanted. Building their character the way I wanted. It really felt like I myself was part of this universe. Whenever I see Shepard talking to Liara, Garrus, Tally, Rex, Caden, Ashley, Miranda, Jacob, Jack, Morden, Grunt, Thane, Samara, Legion, Kasumi, Zaid, Anderson, Joker, Javik, or all of these other characters, I see myself. That's me talking to all those people. That is when you know that you created a role-playing experience that truly earned its mantle as one of the most beloved video game franchises of all time. If Bioware just gave us that ending, that special ending where we see the end result of all the choices we made, all the relationships we built, the conclusion to so many storylines, if Bioware just gave us that sense of closure, every single moment of stupid bullshit that happened in this game, all of it would have been worth it for me. But no, one final fuck you before it's all over. And here we go. Hackett tells Shepard the Crucible is in firing and they go to investigate. A platform appears in front of them and takes them to the Citadel surface. And then... <sighs> the Star Child appears. <laughs> Wake up. What? Where am I? The Citadel. It's my home. Where do I begin with this fucker? I mean, what is there to say about this piece of shit that hasn't already been said? I know it's been 10 years, but I'm still angry that any living, breathing human being that worked on this game ever believed for a single second that this was a good idea. With no build-up, no foreshadowing, and no hints to his presence whatsoever, in the last 20 minutes of the series, this asswipe appears claiming that he's the catalyst and he's the mastermind behind the Reapers. Insulting doesn't even begin to describe it. Every line of dialogue, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, every line of dialogue that comes out of this pissant's mouth is a plot hole. Every single thing he says is a slap in the face that shatters the lore, our understanding of how the Mass Effect universe operates, the mystique behind the Reapers that made them intimidating, all the choices we made as Shepard up to this point, and all the time you invested in this franchise. Don't believe me? Let's watch. I thought the Citadel was the catalyst. No, the Citadel is part of me. If the Citadel is part of you and you're the collective intelligence of the Reapers, why did you never think to help Sovereign open the Citadel Relay to begin your invasion? You claim it's your home, yet you never had the power to activate it yourself? 
I need to stop the Reapers. Do you know how I can do that? Perhaps. I control the Reapers. I'm pretty sure that's not how I remember it. Sovereign isn't just some Reaper ship Saren found. It's an actual Reaper. Reaper. A label created by the Protheans to give voice to their destruction. In the end, what they chose to call us is irrelevant. Where did you come from? Who built you? We have no beginning. We have no end. We are infinite. They are my solution. The solution to what? Chaos. Oh, fuck you, you're here to prevent chaos. You've caused more chaos in the entire galaxy than any living organism in history. You caused the Rachni War. You caused the Geth to go insane. You abducted life forms and horrifically turned them into liquefied pus so you can keep participating in your sadistic Reaper blending ceremony. And you're blowing up buildings and actively killing organisms without the process of harvesting them, which you claim is your motivation behind this stupid cycle. The created will always rebel against their creators. You are welcome to return to Rannoch at Moran with us. But we, we found a way to stop them. that from happening. A way to restore order. By wiping out organic life? No. We harvest advanced civilizations, leaving the younger ones alone. How does that make it less sadistic? You make the choice to wait until a civilization reaches its apex before attacking them and making them suffer slow and horrible deaths. How is that not wiping out organic life? Just as we left your people alive the last time we were here. But you killed the rest. We helped them ascend so they could make way for new life, storing the old life in Reaper form. Yeah, you still killed them against their will taking away their right to live and taking away their freedom. You're just making up excuses for being a serial killer. Also, if your goal is to reserve life by turning it into a Reaper, then you've just put entire species in danger of being killed. We've already killed several Reapers by this point, meaning we've already wiped out entire multiple species from existence. But how are we supposed to concern ourselves with that when you're using the Reapers to slaughter us? And what do you mean by saying this has to be done to make way for new life? Do you really think there will be no new life unless you perform a cycle of genocide? Do you just not understand how immeasurably enormous the universe is? I think we'd rather keep our own form. No, you can't. Without us to stop it, synthetics would destroy all organics. Really? Is that what this is all about? You perform a cycle of genocide for countless eons to prevent synthetics from destroying organics. The very thing you're doing right now? All of that mystique, all of that mystery behind what motivated the Reapers and it was all over the whole synthetic versus organics thing? This could be the stupidest plot twist I have ever seen in a narrative-driven video game. Let me count the ways this is bullshit. Your goal is to prevent synthetics from destroying organics, so your solution is to destroy organics yourself? Along with any synthetic life forms that become sentient? You mean to tell me you didn't step in when the humans and Tyrians were in conflict? When the Krogan and Salarians were in conflict? When the Rachni were fighting multiple species despite that none of them involved synthetics in their confrontations? These races were already in conflict regardless if they built synthetics. You claim to be a solution to chaos, yet you never did anything about about the chaos going on. Your argument is that you're okay with organic life forms killing each other, but when robots get involved, suddenly it becomes your problem. The humans, Turians, Asari, Silarian, Vorcha, and so forth never invented any form of sentient AI and they were still in conflict. What if they all ended up killing each other anyway, regardless if they invented AI? If your job is supposed to be reserving organic life, you literally suck at your job. We've created the cycle so that never happens. That's the solution. So instead of doing something more reasonable, like, oh, I don't know, monitoring the galaxy in secret to make sure there's no conflict with robots, you decide to commit galactic genocide every 50,000 years. Your solution is retarded. You said that before, but how do the Reapers solve anything? Organics create synthetics to improve their own existence, but those improvements have limits. To exceed those limits, synthetics must be allowed to evolve. They must, by definition, surpass their creators. 
We invented the internet, my dude. The internet is more advanced than any single human being could ever hope to be, and yet for the last 30 years it's been around, it never came at us with a knife. If you want to make the argument that we'll eventually be stupid enough to invent an AI that will wipe us out, then you know what? We deserve it. This is the same species trying to bring back dinosaurs when we have Jurassic Park explaining why it's a bad idea. I was first created to oversee the relations between synthetic and organic life, to establish a connection. But our efforts always ended in conflict, so a new solution was required. Further proving you suck at your job. Like, did you never consider any form of dispute or communication between races? You're supposed to be an all-powerful AI, and yet you never adapted or evolved to do anything to become smarter and adapt to different situations to find a better solution to this problem over the course of millions of years? We're at war with the Reapers right now. You may be in conflict with the Reapers, but they are not interested in war. Is that why they're vaporizing planets and blowing up starships and destroying buildings? Oh yeah, they're not interested in war at all. I guess all those ground troops made up of harvested humans, Batarians, Turians, Asari, Krogan, and Salarians are supposed to be diplomats. I find that hard to believe. When fire burns, is it at war? Is it in conflict? Or is it simply doing what it was created to do? We are no different. Okay, what the hell are you even talking about? Fire is not sentient. It does not have the ability to be aware of its surroundings. Unlike you, the fire isn't alive. We harvest your bodies, your knowledge, your creations. We preserve it to be reborn in the form of a new reaper. So you're just gonna steal all our religious beliefs, culture, and intelligence by horrifically melting people into goo while destroying our homes and leaving any possible survivors to eventually starve to death in the name of preserving life. Yeah, all those years humanity spent hunting animals to extinction or putting them on an endangered species list, we were just trying to preserve them. Like a cleansing fire, we restore balance. You are directly causing imbalance. Remember the Rachni Wars? Those were caused by you. A war that didn't even involve synthetics in any way. Do you not see how stupid your logic is? I met your creators. They told me what you did to them. We did as we were expected. They said you betrayed them. That you turned them into Harbinger. When they asked that I solve the problem of conflict, they failed to understand they were part of the problem themselves. Okay, well, why didn't you set up a meeting between yourself and the Leviathan? You could have discussed a better solution to the problem besides deciding to betray them. You never made an attempt to help yourself and Leviathan develop a better understanding of each other. At this point, I'm convinced you're just a serial killer trying to hide their sadism behind a stupid supposedly noble cause you pulled out of your ass. The flaws of their organic reasoning could not perceive this. They lacked the foresight to understand their destruction was part of the very solution they required. You do realize that your train of logic is that of an anarchist, don't you? Hey everyone, let's get rid of all the governments because governments are bad. Who cares about the civil unrest that will happen as a result? Well, they've joined this war now. And I welcome their involvement. I am only facilitating their request. What request? At what point did the Leviathan ask to be slaughtered and experimented on? What do you know about the Crucible? The device you refer to as the Crucible is little more than a power source. However, in combination with the Citadel and the Relays, it is capable of releasing tremendous amounts of energy throughout the galaxy. And it's also the key to activating a super weapon capable of killing you. Why would you give us any chance of activating it if you're so obsessed with your mission to preserve life? Why did you allow it to be built if it's a threat to you and your plans? It is crude, but effective and adaptive in its design. If you believe that, why did you allow the civilizations to build it and use it as a weapon against you? Did you just assume they wouldn't come up with a plan if they didn't like what you were doing? Who designed it? You would not know them, and there is not enough time to explain. Puh! Excuse me? You don't have time to explain? You certainly have the time to explain all this synthetic versus organic shit while making the time to explain why your retarded plan makes any sense. And failing miserably. You can't spare a few extra minutes to give us this information? You're not an artificial intelligence, you're an actual fucking moron! Stupid! You're so stupid! 
can remember, this is the series that developed an entire fucking backstory for Zaid's assault rifle. Yet you can't take the time to explain this plot crucial detail? Why not take the time to tell us about the origins of the Crucible and the species that made the original blueprints? I can't believe I have to explain this to you, Bioware, considering this was something you understood at one point, but conveying information to your audience is not optional. We first noted the concept for this device several cycles ago. With each passing cycle, the design has no doubt evolved. Why didn't you stop it? We believe the concept had been eradicated. You, you're kidding, right? You can't really be this stupid, can you? You literally said just a few moments ago that you believe the catalyst is effective and adaptable to its design. And you just assumed that the plans for rebuilding the Crucible were lost? The Reapers, who were relentless and absolutely thorough in eliminating countless civilizations, missed the blueprints for a giant superweapon. Gee, all that buildup about how mysterious and all-knowing and powerful the Reapers are is certainly looking a lot stupider, isn't it? You have choice, more than you know. The fact that you were standing here, the first organic ever, proves it. The reason Shepard is the first organic standing here is a result of utter stupidity on your end. Your Reaper General failed to kill him. You failed to turn off the Citadel allowing anyone to activate the Crucible to kill you. And you allowed them to find the platform that brought them up here. Shepard is not special. Anyone could have ended up in this position if you were so incompetent to allow them to get this far. But it also proves my solution won't work anymore. Really? Just like that? After millions and millions of years of repeating the cycle of genocide, you suddenly decide your solution won't work anymore? If you're really willing to give up on it that easily, then you're pretty much proving that there was never a problem and you were just coming up with excuses for being the stupidest serial killer in galactic history. The Crucible changed me, created new possibilities, but I can't make them happen. You can't make that happen, despite the Citadel being part of you and having complete control over the Relay Network. Why exactly do you need Shepard to make anything happen, you almighty all-knowing star child? It is now in your power to destroy us. But be warned, others will be destroyed as well. The Crucible will not discriminate. All synthetics will be targeted. You built the Citadel. You have all the power over it. You developed the mass relays. You have the Reaper code installed in every Reaper with an identified friend-foe system. You can manipulate the free will of both organic and synthetic life forms. And in the synthesis ending, you have the ability to rewrite the genetic code of every living being in the galaxy. And in spite of all that power, you don't have the ability to reprogram the Crucible to only target the Reapers. So you're basically forcing us to kill the Geth if we pick the destroy ending, effectively making all the time we put into bringing peace between them and the Quarians completely pointless. Oh, and don't forget all the time you spent helping Edie develop her relationship with Joker. Yeah, where's the dialogue option to tell this piece of shit to just shut down the Reapers if he thinks they won't work anymore? Commander Shepard would be like, no, bullshit, how about we've earned the right to shut the Reapers down? Not destroy all synthetic life in the galaxy, but just shut them down. I suppose you could do that if you've established that the Reapers have their own code. Oh wait, they did. So destroy that code and shut them down. Yes. But the peace won't last. Soon, your children will create synthetics, and then the chaos will come back. Bitch, I just proved your argument to be full of shit by bringing peace between the Corians and Geth. I made it this far. We'll destroy you without setting it off. Impossible. You are vastly outnumbered. You have sacrificed many of your resources just to reach this point. If you do not use the Crucible, the Reapers will not be stopped, and the cycle will continue. You literally just said your solution won't work anymore. What's the point of keeping it going just because Shepard doesn't like your offer? Why are you going to keep up this stupid cycle if it's already been proven to not work? You really do get off to committing mass slaughter, don't you? You could instead use the energy of the Crucible to seize control of the Reapers. So the elusive man was right after all. Oh. Ho oh, ho, now this is rich. We have spent the entire game fighting Cerberus because Tim's philosophy about controlling the Reapers was wrong. 
And now we're being told it was a right option all along. Shepard was just a self-righteous fool who couldn't accept the facts. And by extension, so is the player. Additionally, the control ending shows how the Reapers, after all this time, had the power to help and advance galactic civilizations, and could have done so at any time. So really, the Star Child was committing a cycle of genocide for countless eons, for literally no reason. It's mind-boggling. It's baffling. It's incredibly stupid. Yes, but he could never have taken control, because we already controlled him. Wait a minute. If you never believed him was capable of controlling you, why did you perceive Sanctuary as a threat? I thought the entire point of that mission was that you attacked it since Cerberus learned about the secrets of indoctrination and discovered a method for controlling the Reapers. Can you at least try to be consistent? Jesus Christ, Bluey has more consistency than you. You will die. You will control us, but you will lose everything you have. Hey, here's a suggestion. Why don't you just command the Reapers to isolate themselves in dark space? That way they can stop destroying the galaxy and Shepard doesn't have to sacrifice themselves. You literally control the Reapers. Just tell them to drift off into the void and never return. You really aren't all that smart, are you? D what am I saying? That's a stupid question to ask. I didn't fight this war so I could give up everything I have. And I do not look forward to being replaced by you, but... Then why the fuck did you give Shepard the ability to find your secret lair and give them the option to replace you? There is another solution. Synthesis. And that is? Add your energy to the crucibles. The chain reaction will combine all synthetic and organic life into a new framework. A new DNA. The Reapers are already a fusion of synthetic and organic material. You're literally suggesting the same thing you've been doing for eons. And on top of that, this ending is just insulting. You're basically turning Shepard into a massive hypocrite who's going to force everyone to fuse with synthetics against their will. Not only that, it's completely counterintuitive to the rest of the series. Mass Effect is supposed to be about proving the importance of uniting diverse people for a purpose, and how their diversity is important to the development of galactic civilization. Didn't Javik once say that the reason the Protheans were defeated was because they had only a single battle strategy, and the Empire was too homogenized? Yet the Synthesis ending says the only way to have peace is to force everyone to to be the same green-eyed glowing reaper hybrid. This ending literally goes against everything we've been fighting for. It systematically takes away everything that made the Mass Effect universe special. I don't even know why Bioware even made this an option. Why did we go through all this trouble? Why did Shepard spend all that time helping everyone accept each other's differences just to force them to become a singular DNA? It's completely contradictory to the motivations and goals of the player and the protagonist themselves. Organics seek perfection through technology. Synthetics seek perfection through understanding. Organics will be perfected by integrating fully with synthetic technology. Synthetics, in turn, will finally have full understanding of organics. It is the ideal solution. I thought you said the Reapers were a perfect fusion of synthetic and organic material. So why are we even being given this option? Now that we know it is possible, it is inevitable we will reach synthesis. Why couldn't you do it sooner? We have tried a similar solution in the past, but it has always failed. If you have to tell us your attempts always ended in failure to the point you thought galactic genocide every 50,000 years was the only viable option, you're basically telling us you failed at your job for billions of years. You stupid moron. Why? Because the organics were not ready. It is not something that can be forced. And yet you think you can force it on them now? You've already been forcing your ways onto the citizens of the Milky Way for eons. You force them into being harvested and turned into reapers. What will Shepard's opinion matter if the method has already been shown to work? What difference will Shepard's DNA make? Care to explain that? You're asking me to change everything. Everyone. I can't make that decision. I won't. Why not? Synthetics are already part of you. That is nowhere near the same thing as forcing everyone to fuse their DNA with each other. Tim and planting Shepard with cybernetics has nothing to do with the ethics of this decision. Can you imagine your life without them? Yeah, Mass Effect 1. 
way before Tim gave Shepard the implants. Also, I would imagine that cyborgs are more common in the future. You really think the idea of organic beings with synthetic implants is some sort of unheard concept? And if you think it's inevitable that we'll reach synthesis, why did you bother trying to force your own method for billions of years? Your time is at an end. You must decide. No. I'm gonna end this war on my terms. Then you will die knowing that you failed to save everything you fought for. I fight for freedom. Mine and everyone's. I fight for the right to choose our own fate. And if I die, I'll die knowing that I did everything I could to stop you. And I'll die free. So be it. The cycle continues. You know what? I think I'm gonna need some help with this one. GCN, would you like to give us your thoughts? Ladies and gentlemen, if you have managed to watch this entire video up until now, hopefully you have come to realize what a legendarily awful piece of trash this game truly is. If not, let me put this in perspective for you. This dialogue wheel has been at the core of Mass Effect since the beginning. By using it, we have stopped entire wars. We have prevented genocide of entire species. We have solved centuries-old conflicts and we have convinced indoctrinated individuals to commit suicide. And yet, at the most important part of this entire trilogy, we do not have any Paragon or any Renegade options to tell this idiot that he is wrong, that his solution is wrong, that he is fundamentally flawed, that he is insane, contradictory, and illogical, that the Reapers are an abomination, that he has become the very problem he was created to solve, that he should just permanently deactivate the Reapers and perish. The only way to argue against him is to choose the refusal ending, and all that does is give Bioware's middle finger to every fan of this series who complained about this ending. And you know what? That's the most offensive thing about the ending. Five years, three games, hundreds of hours of gameplay getting invested in this universe and its characters, and this is what it was leading up to. Commander Shepard becoming a lapdog and accepting the Star Child's bullshit. No matter what you do throughout all three games, no matter what personality you gave Shepard, they just accept this utter stupidity. And if you choose the refusal ending, Bioware sends the message that you're going to love their ending no matter how bad it is, or everyone dies for a lost cause. In spite of Mass Effect being a series about choice, you are given no choice in the matter. If you tell the Star Child you don't like these choices, you're given a terrible fourth ending where they just cut to Liara leaving a message for a future civilization. You don't even get to see any of your friends, comrades, allies, or united forces making a final stand against the Reapers. At least some kind of payoff for all the time we invested in this series. It didn't have to be a happy ending, it just had to be something. A bittersweet compilation of all your friends and allies throughout the three games making their final stand fighting for what they believe in, even when they know they can't win. Something that would give the refusal ending a real sense of tragedy. Something that would give it value. But no, the only thing the refusal ending amounts to is a giant fuck you from Bioware if you didn't like the stupid options the Star Child gave you. You're given no real option to refuse these choices and the true ending is locked behind the other three endings. But no matter which one you choose, you're getting screwed over. If you pick Synthesis, you're basically siding with the Star Child after all the blatant stupidity he spewed over the last 10 minutes and force his whims on the entire galaxy against their will. If you pick Control, Shepard becomes a massive hypocrite. We spent the entire game fighting Tim because his idea of controlling the Reapers was bloated nonsense. We just got done having a conversation with him about how controlling the Reapers is a stupid idea when our goal since the beginning was destroying them. And now we're just going to become everything we've been fighting against? Yeah. Let's make Shepard the new star god for the hell of it. That doesn't sound stupid at all. 
And if you pick the destroy ending, you're making the decision to kill the Geth, an entire other species with sentience, after all the time you spend convincing the Koreans to let them have their right to live, because the Starshma can't reprogram the Crucible to only target the Reapers. The Shepherd I built throughout my playthrough, hell, every Shepherd built by every single individual human being who ever invested time in these games, would never accept the Star Child's nonsense. Shepherd has defied impossible odds for three whole games. They put an end to centuries-old conflicts. They helped form alliances between alien races who have hated each other for hundreds of years. They broke through Saren and Tim's indoctrination, helping them find that last shred of humility still lingering inside them. They negotiated peaceful solutions for dozens, hundreds of impossible situations where anybody else would have caused a bloodbath. And now, in the most crucial moment of the entire story, Shepard does not reject the Star Child's logic. They just accept one of the three options regardless of how stupid they are. They give in to the idea that organics and synthetics will always be in conflict when they just brought peace between the Quarians and Geth. Shepard is a character defined by the player controlling them. Thus Shepard by extension is us, the player. We have spent all of Mass Effect fighting for self-determination and our ability to choose. It has been the core of Mass Effect since the beginning, shaping Shepard in a way that puts us in their shoes. But here, we are not given the ability to tell the Star Child that this is wrong. In spite of the giant mountain of evidence that goes against every single argument he's made since he walked on screen. It's basically forcing us the player to be an idiot who accepts the Star Child's nonsense when we do not believe it in any way. That is complete and utter Horseshit! Mass Effect is a series about choice, but the only choice here is deciding which color explosion you prefer. That is the biggest middle finger I have ever seen from a video game franchise that spends so much of its time telling us that we're free to make our own choices. And it's especially insulting to our intelligence after all the time we invested in this franchise. <sighs> you know what? I'm done. This review's over. I'm finished. I just don't care anymore. The series has completely collapsed on itself. There is no point in recapping any more of this story, because the rest of it is literally just a shitty slideshow that doesn't even cover all the characters you've interacted with throughout the series, and a cheap fakeout where they briefly show Shepard taking a single gasp for air, and then it immediately cuts to black. Hi, I'm Captain America, here to talk to you about one of the most valuable traits a soldier or student can have, patience. Sometimes patience is the key to victory, sometimes it leads to very little, and it seems like it's not worth it. And you wonder why you waited so long for something so disappointing. You know that really cheesy movie or TV show you saw in the 90s when you were young and impressionable and thought it was the coolest thing ever, but then decades later you look back on it with an adult mind and realize how stupid everything about it was? That's Mass Effect 3. I mean it. I didn't even show you half of the nonsensical bullshit that this game had. The story is rushed in so many areas, with more plot holes and continuity errors than you can shake a singularity at. A lot of the dialogue is so cringe-inducing, with so many unbearable and convoluted lines that just go beyond the realm of ridiculous. So many of the characters are wasted, underutilized, stupid, mishandled, contradictory, with motivations that make zero sense and artificially characterized to serve this nuclear wasteland of a plot. The world building is completely backwards, committing so many atrocious retcons that make the world of Mass Effect less interesting. The villains are complete and utter morons, who diminish their intimidation factors on backwards logic and self-destructive goals. And in spite of the developers constantly telling us that we have the ability to make all sorts of different choices, the path of the narrative is painfully linear. The abundance of dialogue options we had in previous games are completely stripped away, with the wheel being thoroughly neutered. 
And what really bothers me about the abandoned squad mates we cared about getting sidelined is that they could have easily fit the slots of the new squad mates that no one even bothers to remember. Zaid, Kasumi, Jack, Samara, even Jacob had more personality and established character than James Vega. And even then, most of your squad mates are just recycled from Mass Effect 1, with less diversity and options available to you than Mass Effect 1 and 2. The story has a lot of interesting scenarios, but many of them are cheapened, rushed, badly written, or completely abandoned. And I feel like what hurts most about this whole thing is that it didn't have to be this way. There was no reason that Bioware couldn't put out a better story than what they went with here. It's like a completely different team of writers with no knowledge of the first two games took over and instead of thinking about how to put the narrative together in a way that made sense, they just threw whatever random bunker stuff came to their heads at the wall to see what would stick. Even the ending ends up being meaningless in the grand scheme of things, if that even makes sense. The game has three different endings where you choose what Shepard's final decision is, with an additional choice provided by the extended cut. But since the trailer for Mass Effect 4 confirmed the destroy ending to be canon, it's going to make your playthrough even more obsolete lead if you chose one of the other endings. Maybe it was the hype at the time, but I have no idea why it took me this long to realize what a legendarily awful piece of trash this story is. And it's really, really sad. Because in spite of everything I've said throughout this video, I still have a soft spot for this game. I get why people like it. I really, really do. It's not like there was absolutely no good writing that was put into it. There were actually moments in the game that kept me interested and made me care about these situations. There were times that the characters were well written, or you had an interesting down-to-earth conversation with them. There were times where the dramatic moments were effective or strong enough to make a certain scene interesting. There were side missions that were actually fun to play through with worthwhile dialogue and character interaction. I don't want to say Mass Effect 3 did nothing right, because that's clearly not true. There were moments of good writing and character development that was possible to make out through the cracks. In the beginning of the video when I said Mass Effect 3 had some of the best moments out of any of the three games, I really mean it. Things like Javik's character arc, Jack rising above her abuse and trauma and seeing her become a better person, Morden's sacrifice, Grunt's heroic stand against the corrupted Rachni, those conversations you had with Thane on the Citadel before his fight with Kai Lang, that final conversation with his son before passing away, your conversations with her not Bakara, that bro moment with Rex passing down stories about Shepard meaning hero, all those one-on-one -on -one chats with Liara, Garrus, and Tally, the fun banter between squadmates on the Normandy, all those nods and references to side quests and side characters from the first two games, that final conversation with Anderson, that this is all proof that Mass Effect 3 could have been one of the greatest third entries in a video game trilogy ever made if they just put more time into thinking this story through. But with all the crazy just shit flying around in this completely broken narrative, it's impossible to ignore the smell. I guess what I'm trying to say is that the most disappointing thing about Mass Effect 3 isn't the story, the characters, or even the ending. The most disappointing thing about Mass Effect 3 is its unrealized potential to be a masterpiece. I really want to believe that if EA just didn't force Bioware to complete the game on a strict deadline and if it was given that extra year of development, then the story could have been a lot more satisfying. But in all these interviews I've seen, Bioware just seems way too prideful of the final product, in a way that they think the rushed end result that they put out was acceptable. A lot of the conflicts are not properly set up or explained very well, and the numerous ways that the script was cut during production just makes the overall product feel less complete. The presentation of events and the order in which they happen is really sloppy, and the tone is constantly shifting in all sorts of terrible directions. Several of the themes are unengaging with how they're handled by the writers, and many of the characters are so inconsistent that they feel like completely different characters. It's not like the people who worked on Mass Effect 3 are incapable of telling a good story. We saw in Mass Effect 1, and even 2, that they can put out some engaging and compelling writing, which makes you wonder even more what was going on in their heads when they came up with all these ridiculous ideas. These were incredibly easy to avoid mistakes that I cannot believe they actually made. It's so embarrassing that this game doesn't even feel like it's from the same franchise as the first two. We already had good storytelling in Mass Effect 1 and 2, so let's make Mass Effect 3 a mindless action game. That is the logic that this game operates on. It's far from one of the worst experiences I've ever had. Believe me, I've seen far worse. But I just can't think of another game that brought more widespread disappointment to its fanbase than this one. It dropped the ball so badly that it made me feel indifferent towards the future of the franchise. I know there's Mass Effect 4 coming up, and it looks like it's going to try and give us actual closure for the story of Commander Shepard, but given Bioware's reputation in recent years, let alone their current status, I have very little hope that this will give us the closure we're looking for. 
It's honestly really sad that this ended up happening to Mass Effect. Ten years ago, it was at the top of the world, one of the most celebrated video game franchises ever made. Now it's just another third-person shooter. It didn't even have to be the best entry in the series, just a satisfying one. But Mass Effect 3, as it is, is simply not a satisfying conclusion. And this trilogy deserved a lot better. Its rich world, compelling characters, interesting history, groundbreaking role-playing mechanics, it feels like it was leading up to something so much bigger. But it feels like it just amounted to nothing in the end. And that's disrespectful for all the time we put into this trilogy. And it's also disrespectful for a franchise that could have been so much more.